So uh, if you guys have not been here for the last uh, a week or so, you don't know this, but what we're looking at is ways that we can repair our marriage or having a as long as we both shall live kind of marriage. So I always like to preface it with this. If you're single or if you're dating, that doesn't mean you get a walk out. This is not for me. Trust me, as any married couple would know, as much as we can lear- learn early on, the better off our marriage will be once we eventually get there, right? Amen? Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about as long as we both shall live. That may sound foreign to you guys because more often than not, we know the um, till death do us part portion, right? And so I kind of look at it as like the half glass full, half glass empty kind of guy, right? As long as we both shall live, it just sounds more optimistic, right? Like as long as we're living, babe, I will always love you. But then we go to the other side, it's like, I will love you until you die. And then it's over, right? Like it's just, hey, we're looking at the half glass full, right? So what we're looking at is the, the positive signs of marriage. And so um, part of the rules as we talk about this, as, as you're sitting next to your spouse or you're thinking of perhaps your future spouse, what I want to set up now and get you guys to understand is that this message is for you, not for them. Okay? This message is for you. So even if you think the whole time that, oh, Oh, that's a good one for him. He does that to me all the time. Get him, Sean. No, 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 right? So this message is for you, and if if God ministers to them, so be it, but check yourself first, okay? So let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this time. God, we pray that we just all position our hearts to receive what you have for us. God, that every single one of us um, has a message from you, that you are here to minister To all of us, God, we pray that my words are not my words, but God, that they're your words and that you're speaking today, that this is your your message to marriages out there today. Um, God, we thank you so much for this time, and we pray that you just take hold of this sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. So as as we're talking about marriages, uh, there's a theme verse that we're going to be working out of. Um, It's 1 Corinthians 13, 7. So it said, love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And so we've looked at this message. I mean, most of us have heard the scripture before. If not, when we look at this, it's such a beautiful way to see how God loves us, right? Like I look at that and I instantly recognize it and say, man, God never gives up on me. And to me, that's a big deal because I would have given up on me, right? But God never gives up on me. He sees through every circumstance. His love endures forever. But can I tell you guys that this love can accompany your marriage, that this love can come from your spouse, this love can come from you, or this love can come from your future spouse or yourself or your future whoever, right? But this love is the love that we can have in our lives every day in our marriage, but many of our marriages aren't seeing this, right? In fact, as we look at statistics, we brought up last week, if you weren't here, is that marriages, when you agree to this, as long as we both shall live, or this till death do us part notion, you're flipping the coin. It's a 50-50 shot that this marriage is going to work. In fact, it's even less than 50% chance that your marriage is going to work. So it gets silent. Some of you guys didn't know that stat. Now you're just like, oh my gosh, (laughs) it's not going to make it. No, no, no. You have to understand something, is that God can change the odds, right? So we look at a flight. Before you go on a flight, and somebody's standing there, the pilot's standing there, he says, hey, you know, as you're coming on, Jason kind of touched on this last week, Pastor Jason, he says, you know, the pilot tells you you got a 50% chance that this flight's going to make it or crash, right? Every single one of us, come on, be real, right? Every single one of us would be like, hold up, let me go back, right? I made a bad choice. I don't want to go to Vegas that bad. Never mind. <laughs> but then we have some degenerate, you know, gamblers. They're just like, oh, nope, I'm going, man. <laughs> I need to be there, right? But 50-50, that's not good odds, right? You wouldn't go into that feeling very confident. Yet in our marriage, a lot of times, we have no planning, no resources, but we just jump in, not realize we're doing a coin flip. And so what God has shown us in his word is that there's a way to change the odds, right? So that pilot can be standing there, and that pilot will look to you and say, okay, we have a 50-50 chance here, unless you sit in your seat when you're supposed to, you buckle up, that you follow all of our safety rules that we have. In fact, if you follow all of those rules, your statistics are going to jump from 50 to 100% chance that we're going to make it. That's what God can do in our marriages if we follow and follow the instructions that he's given us in our word. Amen? And so a lot of us, though, have fallen into this pattern that um, you're not following 
how God has laid out marriage. Instead, you're following what you've learned in a movie, right? So I, anybody ever seen The Notebook, right? It's like this, be- oh, yes, <laughs> my beautiful romance, right? Those two fought like cats and dogs, and if you fight like that in your marriage, good luck, right? Like, ah, yeah, 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 right? But the point is, is that we can't follow these romantic comedies or follow the way the world is setting up how our marriage should be. If we follow that, that's when you're doing the coin flip, right? So again, we're going to dive into, let's take a look at our step-by-step. We follow these. You're going to have that as long as you both shall live kind of marriage. So the first one that Pastor Jason taught on last week was seek God, okay? Seek God. Like we talk about, oh, the notebook, oh, I'm going to find my one. He's going to be preparing my house, and right? Or they're going to make me who I am. They're going to complete me. Oh, I'm so excited, <laughs> right? No, that's not how it's going to be, right? You need to seek God first. If you want a healthy marriage, God is your foundation. God is your first. And as a spouse, it's also important to make sure that they are seeking God first, and you're not going to jump in there and, and mess things up. So your spouse is seeking God first. You're seeking God first. You come second, they come second. Next one is fight fair. We're going to be touching on that today. I'm not going to dive into details, not yet. We're going to get crazy on that one. So let's fight fair. Step three is have fun. Have fun, yup, yup, right? Have fun. All right, so we're talking about having fun in your marriage. So that one we like to preface and say that's next week. If your kids are fifth grade and under, it would be a great opportunity for you to have them go to the children's center there are things in marriage that are very fun that we'll be discussing next week, right? And so it's best if they're fifth and grade and under, and some of you guys are sitting there like, no, my sixth grader doesn't know that. Yes, they do. They do. <laughs> They'll be okay, right? The, in marriage, in marriage, there is nothing wrong with a little bump and grind. Amen? <laughs> Y'all didn't know? Come on now. Y'all didn't know? All right. So step four, stay pure. You got to stay pure. I mean, that's such a, a huge responsibility in your marriage that a lot of times if you just want to see those statistics plummet, it's when you get impure in your marriage. But stay pure. And then the fourth one is never give up. Never, 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 never give up. Um, that's step five. So we're saying in the church we're going to go through these week to week and we're going to really dive into them. And if we follow what God has laid before us in his word, we're going to have those as long as you both shall live kind of marriages. Amen. You guys want to as long as you both shall live kind of marriage? Yes? Fantastic. So what we need to look at first today is how to fight fair. Anybody ever been in a fight before? No? Right? How many, how many people are married? Raise your hand. Good, 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 good. Put them down. How many guys dating? Raise your hand. Dating, 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 dating. Cool, 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 cool. Hands down. Single, all the single ladies, all the single. Okay, cool. <laughs> right, awesome, awesome. Okay, so check this out. As I go through this, you guys start to notice the hands. So first off, how many of you guys have ever just been in a dumb fight? It was just a dumb fight, right? You and your, just a dumb fight, right? How many of you guys have been in a dumb fight just this week, right? Right, how many of you guys were in a dumb fight on the way here today, right? Right, see some people scoot away from their spouse, right? Like, yes, <laughs> tell me how to drive right? <laughs> there, there are dumb fights that happen. It's always funny because I remember, you know, my wife, Crystal, I remember when we were dating, we were just like, man, I just could not imagine fighting you, right? I am just, I cannot get mad at you. It's not going to happen. And that's my voice, by the way. Like, I didn't, <laughs> I did not think I would be mad at her. And, 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 and when we come up with these things, we're just thinking in our head like, oh, but I love them so much. You do, Now try spending every single day with them, right? (laughs) The truth is, guys, if there's like one thing that's a guarantee is that fights are going to happen in your marriage. They're going to come up, right? So you are going to fight. The the number one thing, though, is to learn how to handle those conflicts or those fights fairly, to fight fair and not fight dirty. Because it seems like once you get married, you're given like the playbook of how to fight dirty, right? Like, oh, man, I I don't know how to have them, but now I really know how to push her buttons. When we were dating, I didn't know how to make her so mad. I'm good at this, right? All of a sudden, right? And so what needs to happen, guys, we need to first recognize areas that we're fighting unfair, ways that we're fighting like the world would fight, and then we're going to take a look at how we are supposed to fight fair, okay? So the first step when we're talking about ways that we fight unfair, kind of dirty fighting, if we want to call it what it is, the first sign is that you're attacking each other. 
You're attacking each other. So when you're resolving a conflict, it doesn't have to be an attack back and forth. But where it can happen is if there's a dictator in the relationship. There's a dictator. And so when we look at that, what that means is that is there an individual that is making demands on the other one? So is there a spouse that basically says, you need to do it this way, it needs to be done like this, you need to start doing this, you need to dress this way, you need to go out at this time, you need to be here, and they're just dictating everything that needs to happen. Okay? Now there's nothing wrong with talking back and forth and having discussion of what some expectations are, but here's where you really fall into the pitfall, is do you react when there's refusal? It's healthy to communicate back and forth with your spouse expectations that you think would be great to have back and forth. It's unhealthy in a dictatorship when if they say no, or if they don't want to do that, or if they don't think that that's a way that marriage is supposed to be, if you trigger a response, and now there's anger, resentment, and you're attacking them. So that's that dictatorship role. Now, back in the day, 200 years ago, that dictatorship was quite normal, right? Like, men ruled the nest, right? What we say is what needs to happen, okay? So... I tell you to do this, you go do it. And as I'm talking about it right now, I can already see that ain't the case anymore, right? Because all of a sudden, women just said, no, I am packing this up. This ain't the message for me. No, I'm talking 200 years ago. But now it's a different life. It's a whole new lifestyle, right? And so now we're pushing for more equality, more back and forth, more discussion in our marriage. Guys, I can guarantee that 200 years ago, that spouse wasn't loving her husband, right? When he's just running around making demands, there probably wasn't a lot of just, oh, I love him so much. I love when he just tells me exactly what I have to do. <laughs> okay? We're talking about mutual love back and forth. And so in this one, you're really going to find trouble as we're talking about that dictatorship is now we've kind of grown into where it becomes dual dictatorship. So it's, it's bad when there's one making demands, but when you're really going to have a lot of conflict and a lot of unhealthy conflict is when both are making demands and both have set the expectation that you need to follow through with exactly what I say. Okay, so that's the first sign that you're, in an un you're having unhealthy fights in your relationship if both of you are making demands. Okay, so look that you're attacking each other, and sometimes what happens is as you attack each other, you fall into this next trap. And that next trap is you have become independent of your spouse. So sometimes we have these conflicts, we have these fights, we don't resolve it. Instead, one of the individuals in this relationship checks out. Okay, so instead of working through the conflict, say, now that the battle's happened, you've said something to me, it says, okay, I'm done then. I'll do my thing, you do your thing. And we're going to make it work for the kids, right? But that's the anarchist approach. That's where you're basically saying that you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and then we'll come together whenever that needs to happen. That's not a healthy marriage. And it may show signs that things are working, but they're not. So if you're saying, my Monday I do this, Tuesday she does this. Wednesday they go here, Thursday they go here. And it's just, each person is just doing their own individual thing. And then Saturday we come together and we hang out. One day a week we have spouse time. Usually it's a sign of an unhealthy marriage, mainly because once somebody decides to give your spouse that attention, that's where you're going to fall into that adultery or that lust for somebody else. Because somebody has basically said, I'm not living the anarchist life. I want them to be with me. And that's where it leads to trouble. So we have to be careful that we don't check out in the middle of a conflict and say, okay, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. I'm done with you. You have to be able to resolve those conflicts. So that can happen when we have the independent of your spouse. Sometimes we have the issue of... Uh, you're independent or you're attacking each other and that leads to the next trap is you hold contempt for your spouse. Contempt. It's just resting inside of you. So I can, I can give an example of this in my marriage with Crystal. So I don't know how many people can attest to this, but um, I, I'm very bad at picking up subtle clues. Anybody else bad at picking up subtle clues? Yeah, yeah, right? So I was under the understanding when we first get married, marriages I had seen fell under the anarchist kind of marriage. So you do your thing, I'll do my thing. This is a sign of a healthy marriage. So Monday night I get a text, hey, Sean, you want to play basketball? Absolutely, love playing basketball. So, hey, babe, you cool if I go play basketball? Sure. 
I heard what I wanted to hear. I heard yes. Sure is yes in my mind. Let's go. Let's go play basketball. So I'm away, and the next night, get a text. Hey, Sean, you want to come over and play video games? Absolutely, babe. Can I go play video games? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes! That's another yes. All right. I mean, she's saying yes, right? That's what I'm hearing. I'm not looking at the body language. So third night, hey, babe, (laughs) racquetball. Playing racquetball. Can I go play? Go for it. Don't mind if I do. (laughs) Gonna go for it. So you guys can all pick up on the subtle clues, but I was just oblivious to it. So one night I come home, and I notice just uh, the bedroom is a little colder than usual. It's weird. I mean, babe, like, I'm home. Shouldn't you be excited? Like, I've been away, and now I'm home. Like, I expected, like, this aunt, like, oh, hi, honey. Instead, I came in, and she's laying in the bed, turning the other way. I'm like, you awake? Yeah. Well, Babe, the king has returned. I'm here, right? (laughs) Where's the passion, right? We're newlyweds. And so I lay in bed, and I'm just like, babe, is something wrong? Like, is something bothering you? She came back with it. She said, you know what? I think I just need to lower my expectation of marriage. So when you think about it, like, there was some contempt building up, right? For her, she's just kind of sitting on this and just saying, man, okay, yeah, go. And he just keeps going, and building up we're not talking about me i'm living this anarchist life just thinking everything's fine everything's perfect and so in her this contempt keeps building up because we're not resolving this conflict and so finally it comes out in moments like that where it's it wasn't even like a lash out it was more so just so this is what it is then right that contempt had just started building up inside of me we're never resolving conflicts that happens in your marriage if you're just going to keep letting the person go right you're not if something bothers you Voice it, have it out, because if you just keep just allowing it and just keep allowing it, and then inside you're just like, oh my gosh, it's so frustrating. Why does it keep doing it? And then every time they ask, like, yeah, go for it. Like, oh my gosh, you know, and, I, and believe me, I'm not blaming her or you if you're doing that, but if you want to resolve the conflict healthy, you have to have it out, because otherwise it's just going to keep boiling inside until something finally causes it to trigger. And so in hers, it triggered in a way that it ended up me having a realization, but if we can all be honest, there's a lot of times that this trigger for us happens and it doesn't end well, okay? So become independent of your spouse. You're attacking each other. There's times you can hold contempt for your spouse. (coughs) And this last one is more so like a positioning of yourself, and that's where you think they and not I. And really kind of the underlying thing there is you're just defensive. So here's a promise I have for you guys. If anybody's been married more than a week, more than one week, you should have already apologized at least once. <laughs> like, guaranteed, you did something that deserved an apology. So if you're telling me you've been married four years and for some reason I've never had to apologize, they've done it like 400 times because they are always in the wrong, it's probably a sign that you're a little bit defensive and you're always thinking that it's their fault and not your own. So for our lives, what we have to make sure is, right, I mean, it's as simple as, again, it's it's... Marriage is a difficult process of two becoming one. So you have now gone with this lifestyle that you've lived one way your whole life and you've created these patterns. And I'll give you a simple example of how this can happen. You come home, go to the bathroom, toilet paper apparently needs to go on a roll. (laughs) It's in the same spot, in my opinion. So one, you could be defensive as you come out and they say, hey, babe, why didn't you just put it on the roll? Well, because it's in the same spot. Well, just put it on the roll. Well, will you quit being so perfectionist? It's on them. That's your fault. Instead of me just looking at me and saying, okay, I will do it next time. I'm so sorry. So there's times that we become defensive, and it's never going to fall on us. It's always their fault. And so that's another trap of an unhealthy marriage, is if it's always them, if it's always them that has the problem, you're probably defensive, and you're never giving any kind of back and forth in your marriage. So we could see a lot of these patterns get created, and a lot of these patterns, sometimes we get discouraged, like I hear a pin drop now, everybody's just like, man, I'm, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the trap of this, what, what do I do? And so we're going to take a look at God has a plan for how we're supposed to resolve conflict and fight fair with our spouse. And so really it's going to come from a scripture we break down. It's in James 1, 19 and 20. 
and it's showing us how we're supposed to work through these conflicts with our spouse. So we're going to read it as a whole, then we're going to kind of break down step by step how God has put in his word a plan for us and how we need to handle these kind of situations. So it says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So I want us to read through this together, just the beginning part. Okay? So you ready? So, so everyone should be quick to, slow to, and slow to become. Okay. So you can kind of see the step-by-step approach. So the first step that James talks about is we need to stop to listen carefully. Stop to listen carefully. So again, I, I've set the tone. You guys all know you will fall into conflict with your spouse. Like it's inevitable. If you're dating, like we said earlier, you will end up in conflict with your spouse. And I just say it, it's as simple as this because God is like changing math when we do marriage. You guys are confused by that. See, your whole life you were taught one plus one equals two. Then God just kind of throws this weird equation at you where it's one plus one equals one. Two are becoming one. And it's kind of like, God, isn't that why we came up with the number two? Because one and one is supposed to be two, but now he's reversing this equation. So again, it's not easy for two to become one. Again, the guarantee is there's going to be conflict because it isn't just like, boop, done, and now you guys are in holy matrimony for the rest of your life. Conflict comes, okay? So again, the first one is to stop to listen carefully. James 1.19 says everyone should be quick to listen. In my marriage, anybody else learned some harsh truths in your marriage? So in my marriage, I learned a harsh truth here, and that is my mouth speaks before my ears listen. Just to, it just happened that way. See, I got married when I was 26. Anybody get married under the age of 22? Under the age of 22, right? And so, like, there's kind of that, that concept of, like, oh, you're going to grow together, and that is a challenge, absolutely. So I thought, well, I'm 26, so, babe, I have all the answers by now. <laughs> Learned everything anybody would ever need to know about this marriage. I read books. Like, I studied up. I read books about how women think. I read books about how marriage is supposed to go. So when a conflict would come up, I could easily explain to Crystal how we need to fix it. So, Crystal, yeah, it sounds like we had an issue with this. So here's what we need to do in the future. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. It's like a trap that pastors come into because it's like, Babe, 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 no, no, remember when I, and the, the congregation went through this too, so here's what you need to do, babe. I got the answers for you. And so I would never actually stop to listen, because you guys heard earlier, I'm like answering problems that she's like, that isn't even the problem. Like, ah, I'm so far off base. I'm like, I know why you're mad tonight. It's because I forgot to clean the room. It's like, no, I'm mad tonight because you stayed out till 2 in the morning. You told me to be home at 10. Maybe, I don't know. Right? So we have to stop to listen so that we can understand what the conflict even is. It says in um, Proverbs 18.2, it says, A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but he delights in airing his own opinions. A.K.A. I was a fool. We a bunch of fools sometimes, huh? Airing our opinions, saying what we feel at the time, not hearing the other one through. But as James points out, if we want to work through conflict, we need to hear what the issue is. There's always the rule of thumb, right? Two ears, one mouth. Listen before you speak. So to give you some tangible takeaways of items that you could do in your marriage as you're facing these conflicts. So one, they're going to air their opinion. But how many of you guys know that doesn't always mean that you heard what they said? Anybody fall victim to this where something happens and get lost in translation? No, 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 I get this all the time. I, like, Chris will tell me something. This happened, this happened, this happened. And, I, and what I heard is, oh, you're annoyed because so many things are adding up. Sorry. No. <laughs> I told you this, this, right? So I, we fall into this trap all the time where we just kind of assume we heard what they were saying. But again, they were trying to say something completely different. And somehow we lost it in translation. Or we're just not listening because we're on our phones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, babe. Mm, I know. Yep, that does suck. What are you talking about? Talk about a fun trip to Disneyland. <laughs> but remember that one time when we had to wait in line for, for that's what I was, right? So we, we fall into these traps. We try to figure out a way. But, but 
I mean, I, I don't think it's a man thing. Everybody assumes it's a man thing. Maybe it is a man thing. I don't know. But we are just so slow to listen sometimes. And, and we learned the different brains in Unity Conference, which was fantastic. Who went to Unity Conference? Yes. <laughs> Seeing those bracelets across the room. And we just kind of learned that our brains are different, right? We, like, have a different focus. And so how many of you guys learned that? Some things made sense, and one of them to me is like when you try to jump into a conversation when I'm in the middle of something, I don't want to tell you to wait because that seems rude, but I also really want to finish what I'm doing. So, for instance, in video games, any gamers in the room? Video gamers? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like this underground movement, right? <laughs> so so I'm, a, I'm a video gamer. And, uh, and Crystal is not. She did not grow up understanding the etiquette of video games. <laughs> okay? There's an etiquette. When one man plays, the other one, you know, there's rules that, that you must abide by. So I'm, I'm playing this game, MLB The Show. Thank you very much. I'm in the minor leagues. I got to make it to the majors. There's this big moment, 3-0 count. If I hit a home run, I'm going to make it. And my wife says, hey, babe, do you remember that? I'm like, oh, what? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Well, she knows he's not even listening to me. This is like the first two weeks of her marriage. She knows I'm not listening to her. So what's her plan? Plan B, I'm going to walk right in front of the TV. <laughs> yeah, video games like, how dare you? <laughs> so I, I can't pause it. It's in the middle of an at-bat. If I unpause it, it's going to get right there, right? It, it threw off everything. And I didn't make it to the majors. And it was all her fault. <laughs> okay? But we have like this focus, and there's just times that we need to first just stop and listen, in the end, was it any consequence of my MLB, the show? I made it to the majors, thank you very much. But the truth is, is that a lot of times if we could just shift that focus and we take that focus and turn it to them in the listening, it's going to go much further than any video game or text message you were sending. Right? So here's some tips as we're talking about ways to show you're listening, ways to stay on point. If anybody's ever worked like in safety or communication, a great rule of thumb is when somebody says something, repeat it back to them. Customer service, yeah? So somebody says something like, you know, when you forgot to take out the trash last night, it's never happened. When you, forget to take out, when you forgot to take out the trash last night, it made me feel like you didn't care about things that are important to me. Okay? So repeat it back to her. So when I forgot to take out the trash last night, it made you feel whatever, right? And I repeat that back. And then she knows that I heard what she said. Now, whether or not I agree with that's how she should have felt doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't, right? Because she felt that way at the time for a reason. It's not on me to tell her how she should or shouldn't feel. So in that moment, she felt that way. So I'm just, okay, reiterating, this is what's going on. Okay. Next time, I will make sure that I take out the trash. I will not forget. So there's simple ways that you could just kind of reiterate to them that you're hearing what they say. Again, your opinion doesn't matter at this point. You just need to reiterate to them what you're saying. And the importance of that, as we talk about dumb fights, how many of you guys had a dumb fight that started over here and somehow you're way over here arguing about why we got the couch when it started at a video game? <laughs> Been there. You're lost. You're like, you're driving, so you're stressed out. And so you start lashing out at different stuff, and then somehow you're bringing up how when you were in 16 and she ignored you at homecoming. <laughs> Don't know how we got there. But a lot of that just comes on when we're not staying on track. If you repeat back their issue to them and you're staying on track, it's going to help you resolve that conflict and not end up just opening up 20 other ones. So stop and listen. Next step, as we stop and listen, we need to make sure that when it's time to speak, that you guard your words faithfully. Guard your words faithfully. So James 1.19, he says, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And this is going to take a little bit further. Proverbs 21.23, he says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut. Just shut the mouth. Don't speak. Because guess what? If you shut your mouth, You'll stay out of trouble. How many people agree with that, right? Everybody looking at their spouse. Yeah, I agree with that. Just shut his mouth. Be good, right? Shut her mouth, we'd be fine. Okay? Shut your mouth, and you'll stay out of trouble. So step one, if you want to fight fair, don't use this scripture against them in the middle of a fight. 
you know, this fight would go a lot better if you'd shut your mouth. <laughs> no. The point is, is that we have to guard the words that we say, and there's a great rule of thumb as we're talking about this. First one is, should it be said? Should it be said? So what you're thinking about saying, does it need to be said? When I'm talking about the toilet roll being put back on the little rolly thing and put back in there, and she says, babe, can you do me a favor? Can you just put that on there when you're in there? Should it be said that I think it's pointless and annoying to do that, that the toilet paper could just sit on the counter? Should it be said? Probably not. I could just put it on there. So should it be said in that moment? No, it's not necessary. So the second question is should it be said now? It's timing. It's a timing one. Because there are things that need to be said. Like we talked about earlier, if you just keep stuff in, you just start holding contempt. So some things need to be said, but the question is, does it need to be said now? Easy example. We talked about getting lost. May ever get lost when you're driving? Huh? How many of you guys handle that well? I don't. Like, I, oh man, I just get in this weird rage. It doesn't even make sense. It can happen like in five seconds, all of a sudden, it's like, what? Why are we here, right? So we're going to Disneyland, and we're driving, and somehow I like took an early exit. There's all this road work. I'm starting to edge up a little bit. Siri's out of her mind saying all these weird things about recalculating and make laughs when there's no laugh. Like, get, your, get an order, woman. I pay you for this. And then there's this moment when Crystal looks at me and says, babe, I think we need to talk about our spending. Babe, I think there's a better time. <laughs> Watch your tone. I get open. Right? So that should it be said and should it be said now. If you have those rules when you're in battle and you're in these conflicts and you're having these issues, if you follow those rules, your marriage is going to have an easy time sorting through conflicts, right? Should it be said, should it be said now. Keep your mouth shut. Right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so as we talk about things that should or shouldn't be said, I have there's some rules that are just things that just should never be said said. Things that just should never happen. And so we're going to look at some of those rules. The first rule is you should never insult your spouse. There's never a point in a conflict that you don't want it to end with you more in love with your spouse. Did that make sense? So as we face conflict, at the end of it, my spouse and I should be better than how it started. And I know that sounds backwards, but if you're following these rules, you will. Because in the end, you now have an understanding of when this happens, it makes her feel this way. So I need to make sure this doesn't happen. Well, if you're throwing insults around, it is never going to end well. You never insult your spouse. Second, never raise your voice or dominate. Never raise your voice or dominate. There is just not a circumstance that that is going to be necessary. Again, the whole point of this is in the end to be more in love and have a better understanding. But if you're going into this just wanting to win the fight, a lot of people go into a fight just because they want to win it. And so in your mind, you think if I dominate, if I stand bigger, if I stand taller, if I start yelling, then they're going to give up on the fight. Therefore, I win because they walked off. Well, that makes me the victor. It's not how it works. So you never raise your voice or dominate. Never get historical. Why y'all laughing? <laughs> Never get historical. You have enough conflict in your life to keep bringing up all the other ones still. I say that again. You have enough conflict going to happen tomorrow, today, next week. Conflicts are coming. If you're still holding on to the conflict and baggage of 10 years, it's never going to end. It is never going to end. You have to just let history is history. Let it go. Don't bring that into the conflict. Deal with the here and now. This is a huge one for me. And it's one that I had to, you know, work through. Never say never or always. You never take out the trash. Oh, come on. Took out the trash three weeks ago. You always do this. I don't always do that. Just yesterday, I was not doing that. <laughs> when you say never or always, you're just, that's where the rabbit trails happen. So you always sit on the couch when you get home and you don't do anything. I don't always. I get up and go to the bathroom. 
So it, it just, it's never going to end well. Now you're having an argument of whether or not you always or never do it instead of the actual argument that's taking place. So never always, it's never going to stand out. Never threaten divorce. If you think that's a card that you hold, you rip that card up. When you made that agreement to marry them, you made the agreement to do it till death do us part or as long as you both shall live. In our home, I have zero, like, that word is not a part of our lives. I don't bring it into the marriage. I don't even bring it up in conversation. I know that sounds weird, but I just don't want my daughter to have to hear it. I don't want my spouse to have to hear it coming out of my mouth ever. And it, it may be a little bit over the top, but I want her to understand that that is not a part of her life. When we were talking about marriage, I told her, if you're choosing to get on board with this guy, Till death do us part. Like, you ain't got a choice. I, I, I will never divorce you. So you can be as mean as you want. You're stuck with me. Right? It's so bad that we were watching a TV show one time, and I'm looking at it, and the couple is, like, having this little argument. I said, babe, did you hear that they're, like, possibly going to have a D? <laughs> My wife looks at me like, babe, what is a D? <laughs> I cannot think of a circumstance right now where a censored word would fit in there to make any kind of sense. So I finger spelled, because she knows the finger spell, and she's like, what? That's the word? That's the way? I said, no, I don't. It, like, for me, it is not a word that is welcome in the house, and it sure as heck shouldn't be a threat to your spouse. Last point here is never quote your pastor during a fight. <laughs> you married him, not us, right? So you deal with that conflict. You talk it out. You hash it out. Don't bring us into it. Well, Pastor Sean said to shut your mouth, so <laughs> no, you own that, okay? That was, your, that was your words there. So never quote your pastor during a fight, and it may sound silly, but it is true. Nobody wants that in a conflict for you to start preaching to them. So work out that conflict between you two before you try to bring in some kind of outside source. So the last step, as we're talking about fighting fair, is to handle your anger righteously. That's, uh, for some, that kind of sounds impossible. Handle your anger righteously. It says in James 1.19, it says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to, peak, uh, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Even James knows it's impossible to be in a marriage and never become angry. So some of you guys think that anger is just the root of all evil. Well, we look at the, uh, if you look at Ephesians 4.26 and 27, it says, In your anger do not sin. Anger itself is not a sin. However, anger usually leads us to sin. So there are times that we get mad and then we lash out and do things. But there are times you're going to get mad. Guys, marriage is not easy. There are times you're going to get mad. Emotions are a part of who we are. So anger will happen. The question is, is how we deal with that anger. So sometimes it's good to say, babe, maybe now's not a good time. Should it be said? Should it be said now? Maybe now is not a good time. But let's take a look at, as it keeps going, it says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So as we talk about, we're saying, maybe now is not a good time. That conflict needs to get resolved before you go to bed. And so a lot of you guys question why. Like, why is, you, we've heard this a lot. It's said quite a few times. Maybe it's the first time you've heard it. But it sounds confusing. Why is it so important to just not be angry when you go to bed? <clears throat> the reason why is the second part. It says, don't give the devil a foothold. What James is trying to tell us, what God is telling us through James, is that when we're laying in bed and we're angry, do we ever fall asleep right away? Never. I've never slept peacefully because I was so mad. Instead, what do I do? I sit there and I start mulling over what's taking place and I start just kind of wheels are turning I just keep analyzing what happened and it just continues to escalate and my heart is starting to get frustrated and it continues to grow and grow and then you start saying things like she'll never change he'll never change maybe she goes out with her friends a lot so in your mind you're just so angry you're frustrated and as you're sitting there you're just thinking she's gonna cheat on me I just know it he's gonna do this he he's just this way and what you're doing, guys, is you're giving the devil an enemy a foothold. He's the enemy of lies. And so when you're sitting here by yourself and you got this anger and you got this resentment at your spouse and you're not working through that conflict with them and with God, 
Instead, you're working it out with the enemy. And you're starting to make agreements with him of lies that he's sharing with you. And so as it just continues to progress, it just continues to get uglier and uglier. It's never going to be something that is just kind of, oh, it went away. No, it's going to sit there and it's going to fester. And you're going to create a foothold. And then the problem is it creates another foothold. They're going to cheat. Oh, they probably already cheated. Oh, now it just escalates. And so what you have to be careful of is avoiding agreement with those lies. You have to seek God and you have to work this out with your spouse. Because again, what we want at the end of any conflict is for us to love each other more and to stand before God as long as you both shall live. Go ahead and bow your head.